Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Dr. Rolf Van Wegberg an assistant professor of cybercrime governance at Delft University of Technology. The two discuss how Monero is now rapidly replacing Bitcoin as a medium of exchange on dark markets, how crime fighters should deal with illegal activities that take place on them, why governments and regulators should not try to ban Monero, and where he sees this all heading. Monero Talk starts now. But first, a premiere of our gratuitous coffee commercial. From the moment we wake up, we are not alone. People from all corners of the world are with you every day by your side. From the food we eat, to the clothes we wear, to the coffee we drink. People are with you, dedicating their lives to making the products we all rely on possible. That is why we started Gratuitous to harness the true power of cryptocurrency by teaching Guatemalan coffee farmers what crypto is and providing them with Monero wallets to give you, the consumer, the power to directly thank the hardworking people on the other side of the world that provide the products you love by letting you send them a digital cash tip. For our first product, we teamed up with the San Rafael Uidas Farm to bring you the perfect cup of fresh specialty coffee direct from the nutrient-rich volcanic soil of Antigua, Guatemala. To order a bag of coffee, go to gratuitous.org today, where you can pay with credit card or cryptocurrency, and we will ship you fresh beans from the farm. And if you like what you taste, send the farmers a Monero tip to help crypto grow and to provide low-income workers with some magic beans of their own that can grow too. Monero talk really starts now. All right. Yeah, just saying how I, I'm not a morning guy. I've been trying my whole life to be a one. Yeah. Yeah. No, but seriously, uh, again, thanks for making it work, even though it's very early in the morning for you. Of course. Of course. It's not too bad. I got, I got some gratuitous coffee here. I don't know if oh, you, that's great. If you saw that, we started a little coffee company where we um, sell coffee online. And then yeah. we allow people that buy the coffee to send tips using Monero. And it goes directly to 20 of the workers on the farm in Guatemala where we get the coffee from. Wow. We went down there. We taught them about um, Monero and gave them their wallet. Yeah. So which actually I think is a good, a good point because um, brought you on here to t- today to talk about the the more nefarious use cases for Monero, not necessarily the 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 charitable ones yeah exactly Um, yeah and thanks for coming on ralph appreciate it welcome maybe the best thing to do is uh to start with giving your background if you don't yeah yeah sure no no no, uh, absolutely so i have a bit of a uh uh a wobbly career path if you are not maybe wobbly but like um go go, goes about so to say so um uh, first, I, I majored in, uh, in criminology when I was in, uh, in uni. 
uh, started researching all sorts of um, uh, crimes from from more traditional ones to do more um, uh, digital ones, and uh, ended up at um, uh, Delft University of Technology, which is one of the technical universities in the Netherlands, and then uh, did a PhD in computer science, uh, wherein I um, was fascinated by how uh, cyber criminals were making money and and how would they arrange every specific part in their uh, cyber criminal business model. Um, finished that some time ago and um, still researching cyber crime and, and more um, uh, in depth how um, the financial side of cyber crime works um, for, well, I would say the last decade or so. So um, that's still what I'm doing. And um, that's also why I'm quite interested in how certain cryptocurrencies might facilitate that, or on the other hand, how uh, law enforcement might be using cryptocurrencies to to attribute criminal activity. Sounds like you got into this business at the right time, right? Uh, I mean, things that yeah. are unfortunately really picking up, I'd say, in in that yeah. sector. Is that, is that no, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah. So, um, uh, and also what I like is that it's very, um, uh, very novel in the sense that, that it's a phenomenon that changes, I would say, on a daily maybe... Uh, let's say weekly basis, uh, we see new trends and things coming up and it's really interesting. And I think for students working with me uh, on these, um, uh, on this research or in, in the field, uh, they love it too. Uh, it's very, it's very dynamic. And um, yeah, I don't have any trouble finding students who want to graduate on this topic with me. Yeah. So I guess first, what can you tell us about dark markets and the dark web. I mean, it's you know yeah. something that's thrown around quite a lot, but I think the vast majority of people don't, you know, have never experienced it, don't go on the dark no. web, haven't used the dark marketplace. Um, how would you describe what they actually are and, what, and what's taking yeah. place there? Well, a funny note there is a lot of people ask me to, to describe it. And then I, I normally turn to sorts of like analogies and uh, you have to always be be careful with these because normally I would say, you know, it's sort of like eBay. And then I had once that that a guy from eBay was actually in the audience while I'm giving this example, which is, you know, there are a little bit um, awkward moment of silence there. But in any case, so I'm just going to do it. So it 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 looks um, it looks like eBay. So what a what a dark market is uh, basically um, uh, looks like your typical um, uh, eBay store uh, or or eBay. Um, structure. So there are vendors, there are buyers, um, there is a system where in the marketplace X as a sort of like intermediary in between. Um, but in, in, in contrast to its um, well-known established um, uh, equivalents in the uh, legal economy, so like say eBay, uh, this revolves around 99% illegal goods and services. Um, and instead of paying with um, US dollars or whatnot, you pay in, in cryptocurrencies. Um, and one of the things that makes these markets very interesting is that paradoxically, they work with all sorts of anonymization technology. So they are hosted on what we call the dark web, which is the part of the internet that makes use of uh, anonymization protocols. So Tor is one of the most, um, most famous there. So basically saying you cannot be attributed on the basis of your internet activity. So there's a layer of anonymity there. Second, uh, the payment is something that has been anonymized or pseudonymized in that sense uh, using the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. So that means that the whole basis is anonymous trading in illegal goods and services, but here comes the catch. You have to be able to find these marketplaces because otherwise people wouldn't visit them and would it get any traction or the buyers would not be able to find any vendors. Uh, so paradoxically, they're very transparent and open and everybody can find them. And that's what we try to leverage in our research um, so that we can actually uh, keep, keep keep tabs on what is happening out there. You try to leverage, I'm sorry, what the, just the, how people are finding them? No, the, the, the fact that people are able to find them. So the, 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 the fact that um, they are very transparent. So uh, although they work in an anonymous setting, they are very open and transparent in terms of um, uh, being um, visible from the outside. Um, whereas, you know, if I were to be researching 
the drug trade uh, in Amsterdam, I would have no, you know, I know that happens, but if I were to be asked, you know, can you give in an estimate of the size and about who are the key players, I would have have no idea whatsoever. Whereas here, everything happens on this website, which I can visit. I can see prices, I can see advertisements, I can see vendors, I can see buyers. So I can see everything, which is quite interesting. So that's what I mean by leveraging the the, the transparency. Right. It's interesting. We call it, we call it a dark market, but it's, 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 it's not yeah. that dark. It's it's quite it's quite uh, uh, illuminated, right? It's out there for, for the world yeah. for the world to see. Uh, exactly. It's, it's dark in that we don't know who's behind the accounts and who's who's doing yeah. what. Yeah. So it's dark um, uh, because of the fact that we don't know who is who is operating um, behind the monikers on the site. So we don't know um, who the operators of the site are, uh, and of course it's. Yeah, being being cold dark um, since the products and the, and the services that are traded are of course, I say I always say ninety nine percent because you know I you can't be too sure about things that are happening down there that could be legal, but let's say ninety nine percent illegal content, and that means that of course that might be labeled dark too. How so? How accessible are these things? How easy is it for people to to now access? Dark. I would say as easy as uh, viewing uh, a show on YouTube. Um, you know, um, uh, you have to have the address, I'd say the website address, the URL of, uh, of, the, of the marketplace. But marketplaces make sure that that URL is also um, one Google click away. So although you don't use uh, your ordinary web browser to go to a dark market because you have to use uh, the Tor browser, so the browser that allows you to uh, hop on to the um, uh, encrypted communication network that you're using. Um, but the URL you can find just by Googling, um, you know, one of the most prominent markets right now is called White House Market. Um, didn't make up that name, but it's called like that. So um, if you Google that, you Google like um, uh, a tour address or you Google uh, onion address, White House market, I think you have one click away and then you have the address and then you put that in your tour browser and then you're there. So Silk Road is, I think, the one that most people have heard yeah. of. Uh, and then there's, you know, the story is how it how it was uh, stopped, and uh, Ross Albright was yep. now serving uh, life in prison. I don't know. I think it's like a double sentence. Um, and then there's been other other versions since. Yeah, what is the current, um, I guess, trend or current stats on how large dark markets are? Are they larger now than they were? Are they have yep. they declined? What are the um... Yeah, that's an interesting question. So from the start of so Ross Ulbricht was the 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 I would call it engineer of of uh, the structure and and the setup. And interestingly enough, whereas in other fields you would see an evolution of um, uh, how the website or how certain things are, are are done, here it's practically the same. So the, the if you if you look at an early version of Silk Road and you look at the versions of the the dark markets out there right now, they look near identical. So a little things here and there have changed. A lot of security things have changed. Maybe we'll stumble across that uh, later. But the point is that the whole structure, the idea. So it's on the tour. It's it's on the tour network. Uh, you pay with cryptocurrencies. The content is um, uh, illegal, and uh, you use monikers to register. And you use PGP keys to to identify um, uh, vendor accounts. Didn't change in the past decade because that that's that's truly identical right now. Um, so in that case, you could say you know uh, Ross Ulbricht was sort of like a, uh, an, you know if it were to be legal business, he would be a very wealthy entrepreneur. However. Uh, this this is of course illegal business, and then well, you told the story he is serving life in prison. Um, so, um, what are the trends between let's say the starting point then and now? I would say uh, security is one. So um, these websites are uh, taken down by law enforcement. Some of them. Um, there are two versions of, of of a takedown occurring. So the, the one version is. 
um, uh, classical policing tactics like um, infiltration, gaining of trust, and then from the inside taking over the website as administrators. So the police, like um, um, throwing themselves as administrators in the marketplace uh, and then just shutting it down from the inside. Uh, or um, that they have you know, technical misconfigurations that allow the police to follow breadcrumbs, and then breadcrumbs are, in this case, um, Bitcoin payments, IP addresses, etc. cetera. Um, and then through technical means, take over uh, these, these, these markets. But now these, these, these market operators are very um, uh, aware of the fact that that could happen. So they now enforce certain security features on their users, uh, to factor authentic like like on normal website like two factor authentication pgp keys are mandatory that kind of thing so so the trends are in that essence more security of nature like more uh, on a security level and then and that's a very interesting thing i guess is it's not only bitcoin anymore that is accepted on these markets what we see happening is that uh especially monero is the uh, coin that we see uh, that's gaining more and more ground on these markets as a means of payment. Some markets are still um, allowing both Bitcoin payments and Monero payments, but some markets have um, shifted operations altogether to only accepting Moneros as a, as a means of payment. So that's my two cents on, on how the, the uh, ecosystem has, has evolved. What, why do you think it's taken so long for them to move over to Monero? I mean, you, you would think they would do everything they in their power to not get caught. Uh, there's this yeah. technology that exists that allows them to to swap money anonymously and in, a, in an untraceable way. Why have they not all moved over to Monero? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. And, and, and this was on my mind, let's say, two, two years ago or two and a half years ago, maybe even. Um, so what we did is, is together with uh, a group of students, we investigated, first of all, uh, the landscape. So how many websites are around in markets are actually accepting Monero and how many websites are accepting Monero next to, let's say, Bitcoin. And to our surprise, um, around that time, so let's say 2019, we were talking about 15 to, to 20 markets and only a handful, so let's say five, were accepting Monero and only one or two were accepting only Monero as a form of payment and the other two or three were accepting Monero next to uh, Bitcoin. So what we did is we investigated the markets that accept both Monero and Bitcoin to see um, not only what happens whenever the market shifts, but if users would actually shift, because if you have a choice, right, between Bitcoin and Monero, um, then looking into the uh, incentives for both the vendor and the buyer to shift to Monero, that could give a lot of perspective on how how these choices are made. And what what to our uh, surprise um, we could conclude is that vendors, so people who were actually selling these illegal goods and services, would very much like to be paid in Monero. So a lot of these, these vendors would say, yes, please pay me in Monero and, and whatnot. But these buyers were very hesitant to do so. So if they would have an option to buy something from one vendor with Monero or from another vendor by using either Monero or Bitcoin, they would choose the latter instead of the former. And our hypothesis is that it's ease of use, as in right then and there, I think. So we're talking 2019 or so. Um, if you are the occasional buyer of let's say uh, weed and you would look to you would look at such a website to find that buying bitcoin for that one-off transaction is very easy whereas around that time maybe monero was a bit like oh that that's difficult and how do i do that and etc so buyers were hesitant so that that's one of the main reasons why the implementation uh, was a little bit i would say slow because markets are centered around buyers and not per se on vendors, right? Because they need to have the traction of the buyers to, to be on the market to make it a success. Mm -hmm. So because of the fact that buyers are reluctant, that I think stopped a lot of markets implementing this in a rush. That's, that's I think, explanation number one. Explanation number two is a bit more technical. So please interrupt me if this is sort of getting very fuzzy, but 
what I said about how these markets work is they work as a sort of like an intermediary between a buyer and a vendor. They're both anonymous, but how do you make sure that although anonymity is preserved, you don't get scammed by one another, right? So how do you do that? Because you don't know who is who, you're trading illegal goods. So the market acts as a sort of like a middleman. So what the market does is it generates like a, um, a multi-sig wallet uh, in, in between where the vendor um, can only withdraw money from whenever the, the buyer has indicated, I have received my, my wheat, for instance. So the marketplace just keeps, keeps, keeps a hold of that, that payment before the vendor is paid. Um, and this is very easy implementable with the Bitcoin ecosystem in your marketplace. So it goes fully automatic because we're talking tens of thousands of transactions each day. So you can't do this manually, right? So it needs to be a fully automatic thing. And with Monero, you could do that, but it's very, 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 very hard. So creating that system is one of the bottlenecks of implementing Monero on a marketplace. Yeah, so that, that's, I think, my two uh, views on why the, 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 the trend okay. has, yeah. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I would, I would have to, you know, without doing the study, but just knowing Monero quite well, I'd have to you know, I tend to agree with you as, as to why that's probably happening. Uh, so for, this, for the second case you gave, I think, obviously, so markets have figured out how, how to now implement Monero in such a way where they could, uh, trust that they're going to receive the funds and whatever multi-sig as needed. Um, so do you think now the the trend is towards other markets adopting Monero in this way or the ones that already have growing? How, what What is the, then the current trend in Monero versus Bitcoin on, on these dark yeah. markets? Um, so I would say that um, Monero only, so marketplaces accepting just Monero are uh, the new standard. So, so, so that is going to be uh, dominating uh, that ecosystem uh, for a short, uh, in a short period of time. I think that there's still a bit of legacy with marketplaces that are there that accept Bitcoin next to Monero, but those are going to fade out and, and the, the marketplace ecosystem is going to feature uh, Monero only marketplaces um, in a year or two, I would guess. Um, and if they have figured out how to, how to make sure that, that the trust in the system is still the same as with Bitcoin, as in, I mean, not per se the, the anonymity and security of Bitcoin version Monero, but I mean like the, the multi-sig thing, right? So I mean the trust between buyers and vendors. So they claim that they're doing this. So they claim that they are indeed, um, uh, making sure that the payments are hold and, and, and whatever not. Um, the problem only is that there's no way to check, right? Because this is not sort of like a, a GitHub project where I can just look up what they actually implemented in terms of code because that would be, you know, a stupid idea to do because then the police would also look in this code and maybe find some errors. So uh, that's, not the, that's not the way to go. Um, so why am I telling you this? It's because we have seen examples of marketplaces that said one thing and then actually did another and then left with all the money they were supposedly holding where multi-sig wallets were implemented, but they weren't so that they could leave with all the money instead of that they need multiple signatures to leave with all the money. You, you see my point? So, so if they actually make, make this case beyond what they write on their website, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but to answer your question, I think the default is going to be Monero-based marketplaces or the other way around, marketplaces that are accepting Monero only as a payment form. And I guess in terms of the customer side, in terms of uh, ease of use of Monero, it's more of, or I would say at this point, accessibility to Monero itself. So yeah. easier to use Bitcoin in that it's more liquid. You could easily obtain Bitcoin on any exactly. exchange around the world. Uh, you know, no matter what country you're in, almost at this point, you could kind of get some Monero pretty quick. I mean, Bitcoin pretty quickly. Monero, uh, perhaps not as easy to obtain it. Is that? Is no, that I, I, I would say that that is definitely still a hurdle. However, um, when you're comparing it to, let's say, two years ago, Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the, the people that we are talking about that would go on such a platform and buy something, I think um, also their sort of 
experience in terms of handling cryptocurrencies has has improved over the years. Um, meaning that they were are able to to um, pivot from from bitcoins to Monero more easily, both because of the uh, involvement that Monero has gone through in the, in the past years, uh, as in with terms ease of use terms. Um, but I think also the the fact that um, marketplaces, I think, have have made a very good point why not to use Bitcoin anymore, um, and. Uh, well, they got away with it in the sense that still people are going to these marketplaces and buying stuff, um, and they pivoted from or they switched from 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 uh, Bitcoin to Monero. So yeah, that that proves them right in that sense. Do you think governments are trying to make it more difficult, or will try to make it more difficult for people to obtain Monero for these purposes? Yeah, well, that's uh, there's actually two questions in one. So, so the um, the first one, of course, being that um, is the government trying to um, have control over uh, the Bitcoin, uh, the sorry, the Monero ecosystem? And the other one is, can you then filter out the people who are using Monero for bad stuff, right? And I think that. The problem is that whereas the Bitcoin ecosystem is transparent enough to uh, make uh, Bitcoin exchanges, for instance, responsible for, for filtering out payments that are coming directly from, let's say, a dark market and then blocking those, as in not accepting those, whereas for a Monero payment, that is totally different. So, so um, let's say you want to regulate the feature in, in Monero, uh, you know, the making it fungible, right? So you can't. Yeah. Turn between any any one piece of Monero versus any other. But go ahead, continue. Yeah. So no, no there are exceptions, of course. I, I I totally get that. But but the point is, I think that um, uh, it is not. Um, so there is no thing a user of the coin needs to do with with Bitcoin to make it transparent. It is already transparent in that in in that case or to such an effect that. Uh, exchanges, Bitcoin exchanges, can actually perform uh, customer due diligence, can perform KYC, stuff like that. Whereas with the Monero ecosystem, the customer of such a service buying or selling Monero still has to do stuff to make that work. So the question is, can you by default um, uh, make that um, uh, into a regulatory framework? I don't think so. Um, so of course that government, that makes government think that this is, um, a threat because they don't know to what extent they can actually see how much volume in Monero is used for bad stuff versus good stuff. Whereas in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you could make such a distinction. Mm. So answer being, so you, you think governments may try to regulate and crack down on people's ability to obtain Monero because, because of these. Yeah, the, I, I think I, I think they would like that. The question only is: is that sort of like technically feasible? As in, are they are they uh, able to to work from a technical perspective to make that work? Because the interaction that I had with people from the regulatory offices at at the government level have indicated that at least here in the Netherlands, uh, they don't know if it is technically feasible to do that. Uh, meaning the next alternative to that, beyond letting it be unregulated, is banning the whole thing. But they are not going as far as that. But the point is, the question, the question becomes, is there a, a techn technical feasibility to, to, to regulate that to the extent that they're now doing that with Bitcoin and Bitcoin exchanges? Mm -hmm. Right. So next step being banning, do you think we would see governments attempting to ban Monero? No. Yeah. If I were to be a politician, I would definitely not call it banning. But, um, you know, if I would if I would lay down very strict KYC and, and customer due diligence rules that are not feasible to match, you're actually banning without banning. You see my point? In effect, so, so, banning it by by creating rules that you can't yeah can't possibly yeah. exactly. So I think that we're going that direction. That that there are, that there are gonna 
uh, extend the, the customer due diligence and KYC rules for exchange providers that are handling next to Bitcoins, also Moneros. And then these exchange providers come to the conclusion that they don't, they are not able to follow these same standards, um, both on Bitcoin and Monero, as in they can't follow the standards from Bitcoin on Monero. And then the question becomes, what happens next then? Just for understanding, so you're saying like the scenario where you know I have Monero, I'm trying to send it onto an exchange, uh, and they're going to want to know, you know, who I am and where that Monero yeah. came from. So now yeah. telling them who I am isn't a problem. No. Um, how about showing them things like view keys and stuff? Not not that I, I I hope that we ever get to this point, but is that something that you think they would try to do then? Ask for people to submit uh, a view key so they can yeah. and. and possibly meet regulations that way these yeah so so that could be a standard wherein uh users of the of, of the monero ecosystem are involved but then of course the question becomes are users of the monero ecosystem then not sort of like conflicted in why they started to use monero in the first place and then and then and then going to an exchange that forces them to sort of like uh, i wouldn't say betray your beliefs but i think you get what i'm, I'm saying right so the whole idea of the monero system that is counter counterintuitive to what I just said, right? Yeah, so, I mean, um, more there, but uh, yeah. just saying maybe maybe the you know is they would uh, at least uh, attempt to get you know uh, some in the Monero community to uh, oblige this way. Um, so what do you what do you think about this fact? You know, those in the Monero community would would tell you, well, uh, Monero is still unstoppable despite all that. Even if they were to effectively try to yeah. ban it for regulation, people can still obtain their Monero. Uh, you can't stop Monero miners. You don't know who's mining it. You don't know who's obtaining it in the first place. Um, effectively, you can't stop people from from purchasing it or trading for it with things like decentralized exchanges. And now I don't know if you're familiar with atomic swaps, but this ability to swap yeah. between Bitcoin and Monero in a decentralized trustless way where anybody who has Bitcoin can essentially obtain Monero with, without having to go through a third party. Um, what is, you know, your, your reaction to that? Or what do you think government's reaction to that is the fact that, uh, you can't really stop Monero in any way. No, so I, I, I hope uh, that they come to realize that and find, find a way in which users of the system are indeed incentivized um, to maybe indeed um, provide some sort of evidence that we, you just brought up that helps the regulation process. Mm. Um, because I totally agree with you, this is not going away. And um, we're now talking about the, uh, the, good the good kids in the class, right? So the exchange that wants to be regulated um, next to the sheer amount of exchanges that do not want to be regulated, um, neither for their Bitcoin portfolio nor for their Monero portfolio. And those exchanges still exist simply because not every country handles this in the same way. So, you know, uh, I've got examples of, of exchanges and I'm not talking Monero exchanges, but I'm talking traditional Bitcoin exchanges um, that didn't want to be regulated and, and just moved from the one European country to the other. So even in the European uh, Union, where there are standards set by the uh, European Commission on, on how to regulate um, virtual currencies, you see that not every country implements that in the same way. So there are exchanges that just go and operate from Malta instead of from the Netherlands or Germany, because in, on Malta, they don't care. Well, yeah, that's my, my loose translation, but I, I not, I'm not saying that they don't care, but it seems like they're not care. Um, yeah. So I think regulation is a thing that's going to be achieved only when you are like 100% harmonized between all the countries in the world. And that's not going to happen ever. Uh, so, yeah, I think then the question becomes how to handle it without um, uh, without just going into the negative, as in going towards the banning stage, um, to, to treat it in a way that, that respects the community and, on the other hand, makes it feasible for them to participate in a, in a process that looks like regulation. What would your... 
advice be to you know to governments that are trying to, to trying to you know wrangle this um is it that you know maybe they should they should even want to welcome the usage of monero in uh legal legal ways that involve third parties like exchanges as opposed to pushing people out into the fringes and using the this these more uh decentralized methods that are unstoppable so they at least have some heuristic on who's using it so maybe they they won't know exact they won't know what happens after the monero leaves an exchange yeah. uh, but at least they'll know who's attempting to use monero whether those you know, uh, people, what, whether they know what those people are using it for, at least they'll have some heuristic there. Is that kind of the suggestion that's being made? Uh, yeah, no, I, at least it would be my suggestion simply because, um, uh, what, maybe one step back. What is interesting is that this whole cryptocurrency ecosystem is creating a sort of scare uh, in government circles. Um, whereas, um, you know, if I were to buy... Um, an Apple gift card and I would give that to you and you would give it to someone else. And then somebody cashed that in. It's on the same level as anonymous as just using Bitcoin and Monero. If you, if you do it right, that's unregulated, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the point is that in this case, the devil you, you know, is the better than the devil you don't in the sense that that sort of like, if indeed it goes into the, the more decentralized states, uh, or decentralized coins or decentralized swaps or whatever, um, that's even worse, I would say, than, than trying to bring the Monero community into a system wherein they can sort of like still use the coin in which they want to. Um, and on the other hand, that still gives a, a, cer a certain perspective for governments to see what is going on out there with the use of Monero. Because now... And that's a bit of the, 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 the paradox, too, is simply because they do not do not know to in a level of detail that they're comfortable with uh, where Monero is used for. They assume the worst. And that means that they over uh, try to overcompensate on that by you know, like hammering down on, on, on like in the mantra uh, Monero is bad, which it doesn't necessarily have to be. But that's the same with. Bitcoins, and it's the same with cash, and it's the same with Apple gift cards. But the whole thing is that we come to realize that virtual currency is not going to go away, and cryptocurrencies are a part of that whole ecosystem of virtual currencies. But you know, everything from Apple to Amazon to eBay gift cards is as 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 intransparent. Or take prepaid credit cards, and I'm not talking prepaid. Uh, credit cards, let's say that accept Bitcoin or Monero, but I mean like regular Bitcoin, uh, regular prepaid debit or credit cards. That's even a bigger problem as yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. So obviously, you know, we we've seen a lot of um, delistings globally. You know, different exchanges around the world. Um, do you think that's kind of then peaked out in terms of what? what the reaction is from governments regarding Monero and that the trend may then be back towards uh, exchanges listing Monero, almost at the uh, suggestion of the jurisdictions that they're in saying, you know, we wouldn't mind if you actually, I, we know you're, you're, you're trying not to take any risks here, but maybe, you know, it's, it's okay if you, if you put Monero on your exchange with this idea of trying to gain more information on the user base. So, is it possible that, you know, I'm looking at this in terms of a Monero. No, no. Obviously, I want Monero to grow, right? So yeah. um, do you think we could, you may, maybe that downtrend is over in terms of delistings and maybe we would start to see exchanges relisting Monero or not worrying so much about uh, the implications of listing Monero? Well, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, uh... I don't, I don't. I can't tell the future, of course, but uh, I, I think that that is a, a reasonable assumption to make. Yeah. Um, uh, also, simply because, um, let's say, governments are trying to get perspective into how um, and 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 how much and 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 to what extent uh, Monero is used for type of things. Then the only way to do that is actually giving uh, creating an information position 
And if you just, you know, uh, push it out of uh, your jurisdiction, it's going elsewhere where you have less of, a, of an information position. So I think that the best thing to do is indeed uh, trying to work with what you can. Uh I got to tell you, I mean, this, this conversation has been very encouraging to me. I mean, you're, you're an expert in essentially policing, uh, policing cybercrime. And you're not saying, you know, Doug, uh, this Monero stuff, it's, it's really bad. We got to ban it. We got to stop it. You're, you're taking a practical sound approach. You obviously uh, really seem to understand the technology and dark markets. Uh, and you're working with it in a, in a practical way. Um, am I just talking to the one guy, uh, that actually gets this stuff in the policing world or is, is this the, the kind of the trend as well? Are, are other, are most people now thinking along the lines of the way you're talking about these things that, uh, you know, to, to fight these, these crimes that are being committed, uh, when these tools are used, the best way to do that isn't to try to ban these potentially unstoppable tools, but to just figure out other traditional policing methods is, is well, that? I think that that is a, um, uh, a thinking that gains ground at least. Um, and I'm, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm an academic of course. Right. So, so, uh, what I also rely on next to the things that I can, can see with my own eyes, uh, with the research that I do myself, is 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 working together and of course uh, not as in that i am working for any law enforcement agency but we have collaborations with them to to use um uh, data that they might have available from investigations that they're not using for academic research efforts so whenever i'm telling people about that then they say okay but don't you have totally different objectives and then I try to explain, no, we don't, because the thing that we want both is information and more like say insights on how this actually works. And the only way to do that is looking at it from a practical side, like, like you just mentioned. So looking into um, getting getting the facts straight first before you go into your trench or your, or your ditch and shout banning the shit, right? So before you do that, trying to figure out how in reality this actually is used. Um, like I just mentioned about the whole virtual currency ecosystem, uh, people tend to, to say, oh, we don't know what has happening with Monero or whatnot, so this should be bad, so we should indeed ban it or whatever. Yeah, but then, you know, where does it end? You know, uh, and, and how, how practical indeed is that? Because... Uh, at least here uh, in, in, in European Union and in the Eurozone, so the, the countries that use the euro, there has been debate about abolishing the 500 euro bill because apparently they are finding that um, a lot um, uh, with criminals, as in, you know, bags full of money. And that makes sense because if you have 500 bills, the stack is a little bit lower than if you have $10 or the 10 euro bills. But that doesn't make any sense, right? Because then, 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 then you switch from 500 to 200 uh, euro bills and then the, you know, that has zero effect, you know? Um, so banning everything that is criminal, let's use in the criminal sense, from crowbars to cars to 500 euro bills doesn't make any sense. The thing, the, 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 I think the, the, uh, the essence is um, trying to get the facts rates first and trying to see where you can hurt uh, certain criminals the best. And that's not by banning crowbars or 500 euro bills or, or banning Monero. Uh, that is figuring out how to attribute activity uh, to um, on a personal level. So if you are able to use the Monero ecosystem or the Bitcoin ecosystem or whatnot to, to attribute activity to a certain individual and then arresting them, that has far more impact um, or shutting down a, a service that obviously is offering illegal stuff, let's say a, a dark market or let's say uh, a Bitcoin mixer, shutting that down has far more impact than banning something, whereas you know it's going to pop up somewhere that you don't have any jurisdiction over. Definitely. And I I, I hope the, the trend moves in that way. And I think it inevitably will because it, like there really is no other option. Um 
especially with things like atomic swaps. And it seems like, you know, the technology is just improving in terms of its decentralized nature and unstoppable nature. So I, I don't see how uh, anything else could possibly be done other than trying to, to work with this tech. Just like, you know, uh, people, those that didn't really um, appreciate, you know, uh, what the printing press did for many, how to, how to learn, how to work with that. Those that didn't yeah. really appreciate some of the ramifications of the internet, uh, how to learn, how to work with that tool. Yeah. Personally view it that way. Um, you know, this, this idea, you know, obviously I'm a big advocate of Monero. Uh, there's, there's a little banner going down on the bottom saying we, we report on free speech money. I truly do see it that way. I see it uh, as being this positive tool for preserving liberty in the digital age, allowing people to freely uh, transact without censorship and I, I fall on the side of thinking that's that's a good thing because I think yeah. in general people are there's more there's more good than evil in the world and that you know ultimately a tool like this will lead to better things allowing the more free flow of commerce. Um, what's what's your opinion there if you don't mind sharing it? Well, um, how I see it is that um, it's not as different from cash back in the day. Right. So, mm -hmm. so um, in that sense that you're using that in a way in which it's not per se traceable to you and, and it's used as a, as a, as a means of value that is easily transacted from one person to another. Um, so in that sense, it's just like a, a form of payment that is used in a, in, a, in an age uh, wherein um, we're definitely seeing these, these, these digital things. Um, so, so, but it's not about per se my opinion, but what I generally would like to add is that there's this encryption debate going on too, that looks a little bit like the debate on, on banning or regulating Monero, right? So we have this technology, let's say PGP and, 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 and people have thought about implementing that in phones or implementing that in, in communication and, um, the idea there is, you know, encryption is bad because it allows uh, criminals uh, to store information without the police having any knowledge about what's going on on certain devices. There is the famous Apple FBI discussion about this iPhone that was encrypted, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have to learn to live with a thing. It's called encryption. And the idea is that if criminals are starting to make dedicated PGP phones, as in phones that only handle certain traffic with a certain app on a, um, a PGP encrypted way, uh, instead of going after the technology, what they did is going after the trust in the system. So, for instance, the police found ways in which to crack certain encryption standards by using the application that these criminals made um, with these phones so that they can live view or have a live perspective on what's going on on these phones and who is sending what to who without touching the basis of the encryption technology as such. So what I'm trying to say is going after the applications or the usage of technology, which is used in a bad way. I'm totally in favor of that, but going after a neutral if you may call it that, like a neutral technology that doesn't feature or favors bad above uh, good or the other way around, that is a that is a war that you can't win. Or that is that, and it's even let's say um, uh, that that's like, yeah, you you just simply can't do that. It's sort of too late for that because the thing is already there. That's it. So same goes with people who are saying we should ban. The Tor network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good luck with that. Because technically, you know, not feasible. The only thing you can do, though, is making sure that the ways in which you can attribute illegal activity that's going on on the Tor platforms, that that is to the utmost abilities or up, up to the, uh, the, the most advanced standards. And then you're getting somewhere. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm saying is going after certain technologies, banning them or breaking them, not a good idea. Going after the application or the usage of that technology by certain individuals with certain type of uh, activities being, of course, prioritized over others, 
I think that that's a good idea. And we have shown, law enforcement at least has shown, that that is, that that is totally feasible. Shutting down Silk Road, taking over encrypted phone networks, taking down Bitcoin mixers, etc. Those are examples of, of, of uh, law enforcement initiatives that have an impact without touching the underlying technology at its heart, so to say. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great uh, way of looking at it. I, I think I pretty much agree with everything you're saying there, right? So, uh, yeah, not 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 trying to try, not trying to ban the ultimately unstoppable tech, um, but trying to do essentially traditional police work using new methods that are, that are evolving uh, to try to stop criminals that are misusing the technology. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that that's a term that I didn't use back then, but I definitely, I think you could describe it like that, right? So if you're using the technology um, in, in a way that you don't touch upon any illegal stuff, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be uh, forced into a system uh, where everything revolves around uh, countering the misuse, right? So, so I think, of course, there's a balance, uh, banks are regulated, although I think 80% of the people who use banks or maybe even 90% of the people who use banks don't do any illegal stuff. So we have come to, to live with such a world wherein the banks are regulated because they want to prevent that the, that the 1% or 2% of people who use banks for illegal stuff uh, are not attributed. So I, I totally agree with that, although you don't, as a person who is handling uh, or is, is having a bank account, is um, uh, sort of like hampered by the situation of regulation, so that you're not freely, you're, you're not free anymore to 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 transfer money to to whomever you like, right? So th I think that that is the that is the understanding that we must get into also with non-traditional financial means like Monero or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, are there? I don't know if if you kind of have opinions here or if you if you look at this data or are there jurisdictions that you think are maybe doing a better job at this that are moving in the right direction and trying to handle this that uh, understand that this tech is unstoppable and may even align with its ultimate ideals i ran for congress here in the u.s in new york uh and that was you know a big part of the reason why i did it i wanted i wanted to maybe be, be one of the guys that was on the floor of Congress arguing as to why we need to uh, allow this technology to flourish and that to, to yeah. try to stop it would only stifle innovation. And, uh, you know, the, the ideals of America ultimately align with this because it's, it's about, you know, free speech is essentially the way I see it. Um, yeah. Do you think there's, there's jurisdictions or places that are, are beginning to see it this way or, or governments that, uh, you know, maybe are, are going down that road before others and you have well, any? Yeah, I think that, that you could break down um, a, an, an attitude of governments towards, um, let's say, the, the, the more transparent cryptocurrency. So I think that there, of course, there are front runners who are embracing that to uh, in a higher pace than at other countries are. And I think that, uh, for instance, in Southeast Asia, Singapore is a country that embraces that, that digital technology and cryptocurrencies in a trans, the transparent cryptocurrencies um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pace that is, you know, they're outpacing other countries in the area. And I think that um, a couple of states in the U.S. Are, are doing that, too. So there are a couple of states, I think, that, that, that are embracing Monero, oh, sorry, embracing Bitcoins. Um, uh, faster than, than other uh, jurisdictions are. But here I think comes the catch, and that is that um, uh, Monero, you know, being called as well uh, like a privacy coin, um, which involves a more um, in transparency that it covers transparency, at least in the eyes of, the, of, of government and regulators. I am, you know, I'm not top of mind thinking of any jurisdictions that are proactively increasing uh, the adoption of, of Monero in their, in their jurisdiction, um, which is a quite interesting given, right? Because, because uh, with Bitcoin, everybody was like, yeah, this is the future. And then comes uh, like a, a Bitcoin-like currency, um, which has certain features that governments may be disliking a little bit. And then 
all of a sudden that's not our savior, so to say. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's always bothered me that we have yet to really see a strong voice uh, with influence in support of this technology. Obviously, yes. So Bitcoin, you see people coming to the aid of Bitcoin. You see uh, regulators, you see legislators, uh, elected officials coming out there and saying, you know, we can't stop the technology. It's going to create more good than harm. It'd be the equivalent yeah. of stop the internet. But then they kind of draw the line there uh, and they don't really talk about something like Monero in that respect, which is, you know, uh, perhaps uh, even more uh, unstoppable and, uh, you know, more aligned with the original ideals of what crypto was supposed to be. You know, they, they always kind of default back to, well, you know, we don't have to worry about Bitcoin because ultimately it is traceable. So it's going to allow. Exactly, yeah, that, that's precisely it. As opposed to coming back to the argument of, OK, well, um, you know, Monero, uh, it's not not traceable, but we're OK with it because of X, Y and Z, because we yeah. believe, you know, you can't stop encryption because we believe people should be able to freely uh, transact because, you know, cash has always existed so why why shouldn't we allow people to have digital cash and use it for you know um free speech purposes online but you have you have yet to really see anybody in a strong way lead the charge yeah the argument exactly yeah um uh and i think that there of course are jurisdictions who are embracing um i would say financial traffic in general Right. And I think we all know these jurisdictions. They're um, uh, near the Bahamas someplace. You, you, you get what I'm saying? But they, they, they attract a lot of these uh, financials um, that are you know, making its way there. But I think that that has different, less ideological, more economical reasons for them to do that. So it's still indeed waiting for, for a jurisdiction that is going to uh, lead the charge from a more like ideological standpoint. Um, yeah. How about your take on the marketplaces themselves? So, you know, we're, we're talking about Monero. Uh, we're saying it's this protocol that mm -hmm. is kind of here to stay. How about dark markets? I mean, they're becoming more unstoppable as well, I assume. Uh, yep. we, we've seen attempts. I, I, don't, I don't understand them that well, but I know we've seen attempts at you know, decentralized versions of them. I mean, eventually, do we get to the point where, uh, you know, a, a dark market or a free market, if you want to call it, is as unstoppable as something like Monero? Then what? You know, what's what's your yep. take on the dark market itself platform? Is that something that the world uh, may may need to learn to work with as well? Yeah, no, I, I think I've said that for a couple of years now, that that's, that's there to stay. Um, and then people go and ask me similar questions like we have been debating about, you know, should we then uh, spend a lot of time and energy into trying to take any, any and all of them down? And, and do we, you know, uh, need to go for more regulatory banning type of options? Um, where in this case, you don't, of course, need per se banning because all the stuff that has been sold is illegal. So technically speaking, everything is banned, um, which is a, an even more practical you know, uh, uh, argument towards not banning because apparently when you ban something, it's still being sold by the millions online in an, in an environment you know, uh, that's unregulated or yeah, um, untouchable as it seems. Uh, but no, they're here to stay. And um, uh, I would say, going back to my original example that I gave, if somebody would ask me to you know, investigate the drug trade in Amsterdam, I would not have the faintest clue where to start. Uh, I would see some guys running around with st stuff, but I don't know what they're selling and for how much and to whom. And on these dark markets, I do. So paradoxically, for people who want to measure crime, and that's me, but that's, I think, also the police, because then they know how big of a problem we're dealing with. Yeah, these marketplaces are actually not a bad thing. And that may sound very, very interesting because, of course, it is bad because every gram of, of cocaine that's been sold 
uh, is one gram too many or, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole fentanyl eco the whole fentanyl economy on these markets is, you know, very, very, very bad. And I think that the U S is taking charge on that. But the point is that you have, well, yeah, paradoxically far more, uh, information than you would have if these markets would not exist. Um, so they're here to stay, I would say, and we have to try to make sure that uh, to the best of our abilities, we are able to uh, frustrate the activity that's on these markets. But beyond frustration, it is a bit hard. Um, and in terms of evolution or what's next, I would say... Um, yeah, of course, you know, peer to peer is, is a thing that's going on beyond uh, markets. It's, it's, it's exchanges that are going peer to peer, but also these markets are going peer to peer. Um, and that's a, that's a hard cookie altogether of a tough cookie altogether too. So um, yeah, we got a quite a lot of things in store uh, to still work on, so to say. What are some of the methods that are being used that you can tell us about um, in terms of working with the marketplaces and with, you know, technology like Monero. So, you know, Monero is un, un, untraceable as, as far as anybody in the Monero community can tell. Uh, yeah. You know, we've seen, we've seen um, companies come out and say they've developed tech uh, that allows them to essentially trace Monero. Is there any insight you can give us into the tools that are being used to, to work with these technologies, in particular Monero? Well, I would say that they, these, these companies who, who promise you these types of solutions are um, working their way, I would say, around the intransparency of the, of the Monero ecosystem um, uh, by gaining insight into the, the weak spots in, 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 in money trails. And those are the exchanges and um, um, to the exchange provider. So the, the, the exchanges that actually provide the service, but I think also uh, wherever you go from let the atomic swaps, you go from the one type of currency to the other. Those are the, those are the weak spots, so to say, in the, in the system. Um, and yeah, well, that is sort of like big data analytics, basically, right? So you're, what you're trying to do is, is track all these type of um, uh, swaps and, and see if you can track any information from the following uh, transaction path in, let's say, Bitcoin to trace back the Monero activity, if you if you get get what I'm saying, so they work around the intransparency so much. So that's that's one of the tactics. Um, and the other the other tactic is trying to um, you know work with with big numbers in the Monero ecosystem as well. Um, let's say from a standpoint of um, trying to peel or no wait filter out um the amount of possibilities that certain transactions can be linked to if you understand what i mean so there is still of course these ring signatures and stuff so what you're trying to do then is making sure that you decrease the amount of possibilities that is an output to the transaction or an input in a transaction so making making sort of like using mathematics in that sense or, or probability um graph theory um, to make sure that you limit the amount of possibilities that a transaction um, could be getting to or was originating from. But that, of course, is not 100%, right? So that is probability. So you don't, you're not going to end up with certainty. Um, whereas if you, you're using the, uh, the, the, the peripheral side, so using atomic swaps or, or exchanges or the weak weak points in, um, in, in money trails, uh, you could get to a certain point of certainty, but also then that's lucky shots. Those are lucky shots. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no deterministic ways that, no. that we know no. of. No, um, at least that I know of. I have to, I have to, of course, add that disclaimer. Yeah. Are, are we seeing anybody, uh, any governments or, uh, police, units successfully um, use things like cipher I think it's cipher trace is the one that has claimed to be able to essentially use heuristics to probabilistically uh, you know determine uh, who's sending Monero or who's using Monero uh, yeah have you seen or do you know of examples of them successfully doing this 
No, so I, of course, know that law enforcement uh, across the globe is using uh, all sorts of uh, software providers, uh, CypherTrace, and there are many, many, many more um, to gain insight into the vast amount of data that um, a blockchain generate, either, you know, Bitcoin or, or Monero. Um, but, you know, uh, that's as far as my knowledge goes. Um, you know, I'm not an investigator with a police force, so I don't know from an operational standpoint how they would use that. But in general, I can say that these, these uh, software providers are, of course, um, in a perfect position to, to help. And, and indeed, this is probabilistic. So this is not deterministic. This is, this is probabilistic. Help focus an investigation by using data-driven approaches. But what has always sparked my mind is, you know, how to turn that into evidence, right? Because a probability is not evidence, right? Deterministic things, those are pieces of evidence, right? So fingerprints, DNA, that is sort of like, of course, there's a probability with uh, DNA and, and there should be a, with, with uh, fingerprints, but that's a different uh, conversation. But in any case, those are totally different types of odds and totally different type of probabilities. And we're talking about using that software. Um, on top of that, um, these are commercial providers who do not gain any insight or give any insight into how their heuristics actually do work, right? So how can how can you do due process? I'm not saying you can't, but this is just my my uh, curiosity. You know, how do you do that? How can you explain to a judge um, how? you came to the conclusion that this individual transacted this amount of Monero or Bitcoins using software alone, right? So how can you do that if you don't know what the software actually does? So you don't know precisely how these heuristics work. I think that that is something in policing, like in policing, that is one of the challenges that arises right now. So that, that software is very helpful. Big data is used a lot, but how do you then make sure um, that the information you provide is actually information that can be used as evidence. And how do you weigh that? So that, that's, I think, a next challenge and a next step. Right. And if anything, um, well, it, it seems like that, the, you know, the ability to do that is, is going to uh, go, go down instead of up, right? So yeah. um, as, as ring sizes are increased or, you know, swapped out with a, an improved yeah. technology, uh, so you know, uh, no no longer using that tech to to obfuscate the sender, um, or just making it to the point where it's not even uh, you can't even probabilistically tell uh, once the ring size gets large enough. Um, and with atomic swaps, I think you mentioned that yeah. being a potential heuristic, but we're already seeing evolution there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You won't be able to tell when an atomic swap takes place essentially between Bitcoin and Monero. There won't be really any way of, of seeing that on the on the Bitcoin blockchain and, and um, segregating that from any other type of transaction. So if anything, it's it's uh, it, it may be doable now in terms of probabilistically making some uh, predictions, but it seems like the trend would be that it's only going to become more difficult. With regard. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I think um, the challenge then is twofold. On the one hand, for these companies to keep evolving and implementing new heuristics, but on the other hand, also be uh, transparent about how to do that. Because otherwise, um, it is near impossible to use that in cases, court cases, you want to, because then you can't make elaborate or you can't elaborate on how did you come to certain conclusions and of course yeah that is something that is crucial in in due process back to to the dark markets themselves for a minute do we have uh any knowledge as to who is running them obviously you know it's uh anonymous people but is it are they backed by state actors potentially or no no, no, these are, um, you know, Ross Ulbricht was a person who described himself as a libertarian who would say, you know, uh, anything that I can stimulate in terms of um, training and activities without any 
form of government oversight is something I would like to make possible. So that's sort of the idea that that sparked how Silk Road existed or Silk Road came to exist. Um, and then thereafter, I think it's more or less just economically motivated because if you can get a percentage of each transaction, yeah, well then, then if you know that a, a market uh, turns over three, 400,000 US dollars each day, well, yeah. Right, so there's certainly the incentive there for people to yeah. To do it. I guess not so much backed by state actors, but are, are there perhaps jurisdictions that are... are ah, you mean like that? Maybe letting it fly, you know, that are aware that the people who run it may be, may be living in their jurisdiction, but they're uh, perhaps giving them protection for whatever reason. Yeah. Be, well, uh, there are two... benefiting. Well, there, there, there are two angles there. So the one is, of course, technical infrastructure that is sometimes not randomly placed across... The world that also technical infrastructure uh, to run these sites is um, hosted or, or, or positioned uh, in certain jurisdictions that don't seem to care that much, right? So, so there is there is that angle, and then of course, yeah, these these operators are from all over. So, uh, European operators, uh, we've seen Germans, Italians. Etc. Um, US-based operators, we have seen uh, a couple of uh, examples there from Silk Road to Alpha Bay. Um, but what is interesting is that the, the, for instance, the ransomware business, you see that a lot of these ransomware operators are, um, uh, are from Eastern Europe and, and Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, in particular. And it seems that those two jurisdictions don't per se seem to care that those citizens are in that type of business as long as they don't target any Russian companies or um, institutes, then everything is fine. Yeah. And so are we potentially seeing other jurisdictions trying to clamp down on that or come after uh, come after them for allowing these things to take place? Yeah, that's typically hard because, um, uh, you know, a lot of countries don't have um, agreements in place uh, for the transfer uh, of suspects in criminal cases. So then there is nothing much you can do uh, in that sense. So you can build a strong case, but if the suspect has a certain nationality in that um, that jurisdiction is not handing over citizens, yeah, then, then you're stuck, right? But uh, on the level of infrastructure, so, so the use of certain hosting providers in certain countries, you see that some countries are being used or misused, if you will, and those are cracking down on the infrastructure part. Um, and that's happening quite a lot. But on, the, uh, on the, the, the attribution of criminal activity to people and then trying to get them uh, to appear in front of a judge. Yeah, that's hard if, if someone is um, living in a country that doesn't have any agreement with you, as in your uh, nation or your, your country, um, to exchange suspects with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for, the, for these, uh, these candid answers, by the way. This is, you're, give, you're giving uh, the community a lot of, a lot of uh, really interesting insight into you know, how, how these things work. Um, so I appreciate that. You're welcome. I guess a question that I don't know, I don't know if you, if you have an answer to this one, I don't know, I don't know where, what you're thinking is, but um, you've obviously been looking at this stuff pretty closely. Uh, you understand cryptocurrency very well. Do you have opinions on the technology itself? So often on this show, we talk about Bitcoin uh, and we compare it to Monero. I started off as a Bitcoin guy and, and, and eventually became a Monero guy uh, because I, I strongly believe that, you know, the purpose of, of this tech is digital cash. Uh, today, we're talking about some of the nefarious use cases. But ultimately, like I said, I, th I think it, it's, it's, it's going to create more, more good than bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I that Monero fulfills this digital cash use case better than any other crypto 
Do you have any opinions there on the tech itself? So Bitcoin being this traceable, traceable currency, ultimately traceable currency, Monero, um, figuring out how to do the same thing Bitcoin does in terms of uh, allowing people to transact in a trustless way, uh, limiting the, the amount of supply in a trustless way, but yet not allowing uh, people to see who's sending what to who and how much. Yeah. Do you have opinions there on the tech itself and the use case and kind of one versus the other? Well, I think um, uh, the whole idea behind both, and I think, of course, you know, being based on a certain blockchain principle, of course, has a very big overlap between the two. Only I think the application of, of how uh, transactions happen is different. And there is the main difference in terms of uh, privacy you can gain from that use of that technology. I think the technology as such, and I have to add, though, that, uh, you're calling me an expert on these cryptocurrencies and, you know, I might be on, on, on the use of these currencies, but I'm totally um, uh, unknowing about, you know, how the deep, the deep technical uh, features of, of both. Uh, but I would say um, both lean on a very interesting piece of piece of work. Um, uh, I think, you know, can call that proof of concept if, if, if I'm correctly using all the terms. And um, I, I think that that is a beautiful piece of technology, similar to um, how PGP works. I can have, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, totally in awe about how, how that is designed and how beautiful it works, simple um, encryption standards. And, and Tor, by the way, too, you know, if I am uh, in, in a class and trying to explain my students how, how the Tor network works, um, I can see the beauty in, in how that is designed, similar to how, how Bitcoin is designed and how Monero is designed. Yeah, the only thing is that all these examples I just gave are indeed also, like you just said, used for you know, like more nefarious things. And yeah, that's what I do, looking at those nefarious things. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I wouldn't say happy, but, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sort of glad that these technologies are out there. They're used for good things, uh, but also because they are used for, for bad things. And that is transparent to us to, to some degrees. I actually have some things to investigate. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you have an opinion? So maybe maybe you don't deeply understand the tech itself, uh, which I you know only only so few people do uh, yeah, really understand it. Uh, but based on the fact what you're seeing and ha and how it's used, you know, traditionally, obviously, Bitcoin was used on the dark markets, and now we're seeing them move to Monero, which is an indication that. Monero works better for for digital cash purposes, for pur purposes of transacting on the internet in an in yeah. a unstoppable, undetectable way. Do you think that's an indication of the fact that uh, perhaps Monero is a better form of digital money than than Bitcoin? Well, you can say this: that the fact that these dark markets are, are now opting to go for a Monero-based system instead of a Bitcoin-based system proves that the privacy features that Monero uh, provides are um, the top of the class when, when compared to uh, Bitcoin. The only question is, should you then derive from, from that conclusion that it's a better digital cash, um, uh, a digital cash provider I think that's, that's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a hard comparison to make simply also because you're, you're basing your, your um, uh, sort of like evaluation of, of how good of a digital cash um, uh, system it is on how much criminals like to use it, right? So I think that that is maybe a, a, a bad analogy to make. Um, yeah, so I would I wouldn't go there in that sense, no. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think it's I personally think it's an indication that that it works as intended, as originally designed. Uh, you know, the kind of the meme is that uh, Min Monero is what what Bitcoin noobs thought they bought. You know, um, and once again, you know, it's it's unfortunate that. Um, it's being used in these nefarious ways, but the fact that it is is an indication that that it works as intended, 
with you. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. only thing I was just saying is, you know, um, uh, if you're a, a digital cash advocate, I don't know if it would be um, uh, very, very smart in a conversation, let's say with a, with, a, with a politician or someone who is on the other side to bring up an example of nefarious use to illustrate that it is actually a very good thing that it's used in that way because oh, it yeah. proves, right? So it proves that that is the, the way it should work. Right. Uh, because then you get this sort of um, um, uh, you get into this 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 circle like like this this reasoning that goes in circles like oh the examples I know of Monero being used are nefarious so um, uh, that is bad which means that we should ban all it get, you get into that sort of scenario so that's why I'm a bit hesitant to 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 look at it like that yeah but I, I do get what you're saying by the way. I deal with that scenario every day, and it, it, it no, is, I can get you know. it's a tough line to walk. But um, yeah, you know, I, I think people are getting better at making those arguments. Um, I guess last question, and I appreciate this. You we went well over an hour here. It's just uh, it's it's you're a, a unique guest, so I'm I'm trying to get as much as many answers as I possibly can here. So last question, I guess, would be is where do you see things going in terms of dark markets, uh, cryptocurrency, kind of just what's your general opinion? I think you have a, an interesting perspective. Um, where, 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 what can you tell us in terms of yeah. what the future looks like for cryptocurrency and dark markets? Yeah, maybe in, in one sentence, the, the cat and mouse game is going to be taken to the next level. Right. So, so uh, where at first uh, people who are trying to take dark markets down were faced by Tor networks and Bitcoin systems wherein indeed, like you said, the latter was something um, people thought was anonymous, but figured out wasn't, wasn't at all. Uh, and that was the edge that, that law enforcement took uh, and very well exploited, I, I, if, if I uh, be so honest. And now the game is upped. Uh, in the sense that Bitcoin has been replaced by Monero, and the cat and mouse game starts again. And where do you where do you think we we end up? You know, so we, we've seen you know there's historic examples, you know, um, with music pirating, right? So there was that that era where you know uh, essentially pe people figured out how to uh, send music and videos yeah. to each other peer to peer in a, in what seemed like an unstoppable way but yeah. it worked out it became easier for people to just use spotify than to to go on and try to download free yeah. mp3s what do you see as kind of the outcome with all of this if you have any opinion there obviously this is a very difficult question i'm asking you to predict the future but given given what you know what what what's what is it going to look like? Is uh, our dark markets going to be a lot larger than they are now? Uh, used a lot more? Um, is you know what kind of uh, yeah. insight into that? I would say that the the whole digital piracy and and Spotify is a very good example to to, to use here, since you know part of the supply what is now being offered on on dark markets is is I would say fifty percent is about illegal narcotics. And the other 50% is, uh, you know, uh, uh, credit card details sold in bulk, that kind of stuff. So the latter, of course, not going to find a replacement in the legal economy, right? So there is no Spotify example there that, that, that moves the demand somewhere else. But, you know, with drugs, and this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but... Um, uh, you know, legalizing some forms of drugs, of course, moves the demand someplace else, and that creates your Spotify, so to say, right? If you can buy um, uh, then legal narcotics somewhere else where it's regulated and, you know, people pay taxes and blah, 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 you know, that may, may as well be something that changes the nature of these dark markets, as in for 50% of the, the product portfolio. But um, yeah. That that that's you know maybe the, the the Spotify thing happening in the near future, but um, uh, and I actually do know maybe as a funny last thing to mention is I know I know vendors on these markets that are selling let's say weed uh, they made name for themselves on these dark markets 
Um, and then because they are based in states in the US that legalize marijuana and they were selling primarily marijuana on these dark markets, they seized their activity on dark markets, took their username from the dark market, registered a company in California with that exact same name and start selling weed legally. Hmm. Right. And they're still accepting, I think, Bitcoins and Moneros and whatnot, because, you know, they're allowed to do so. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that's an example that I saw just recently, uh, which quite intrigued me because that could happen. And still wait and still selling it on the dark market, too. No, 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 no. They, they ceased doing that. Um, yeah. So they just, just transferred their operation to uh, to a fully legal status. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess most of these people would rather not be doing this illegally. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a good analysis, a good way of looking. Yeah. Ralph, thank you so much, man. This was amazing. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up before we close it out? Is there anything you, you had on your mind that you wanted to uh, put out there? No, I think we... we uh, thanks for the uh, very um, uh, inspiring conversation. Uh, so no, I don't have any uh, any last thoughts on that. No. Thank you so much, man. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. And maybe we'll have you again, on again sometime in the future. Be happy to. Anywhere for people to learn more about you, to, to kind of see the work you've done. I know, I know you wrote a, a dissertation on, on, yeah. on things related to this. And you're, you're obviously constantly uh, studying this space. Where can people follow you and learn more about you? Well, um, yeah. I do have a Twitter handle. And, and I have to say that those... those tweet I put out are on this topic, but sometimes in Dutch, sometimes in English. So that's one of the ways. And I think indeed when new papers come out that I'm working on together with uh, uh, the students that are working on that hard, um, I'll put that on, on, on Twitter or on um, um, my Google Scholar profile, for instance. But, you know, that that's a, um, it's a certain appetite people not, maybe needing to have before going on that right so so you just talked about my dissertation that also of course is for a specific type of people unreadable i would say although i did my best to make it readable but you you you, you see my point right it's totally different from listening to a podcast or anything so um um but you know um people are of course more than um um more than welcome to take a look there. In the Monero community, there's there's quite a few okay. that would be willing to uh, try to fig well, figure it out and and understand. This is an open invitation, then. Yeah. So what what is your Twitter then? I guess if that's the best way for people. That's just my. You see it on the bottom of the screen, right? My name. If you put that next to each other, all the all the letters, then uh, that's my Twitter handle. Very easy. All right, Ralph. Thank you so much. Hope you have You're a great welcome. day, and hope to be. You too, man. Thank you, man. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.